you know, we heard in the general session about uh, uh, Jeffrey's list of uh, 40 Fortune 500 iconic companies that don't exist today. And I think that's, you know, indicative of the fact that, that you know, even once a company obtains a certain level of success and is a large company, um, uh, it, it needs to reinvent itself or it can find itself um, um, much less relevant or non-existent not that far down the, uh, you know, not that far down the line. And indeed, many of the Valley's biggest and brightest companies today, whether it's Apple or a, a Netflix or an Intuit or so forth, are very different companies today than what they were when they first enjoyed uh, a certain level of success. Um, what we have today here is a, a, a panel of executives that um, have managed through companies that have reinvented themselves uh, or, or been a part of that process or are in, you know, enjoying a part of that process currently in some cases. And uh, what we hope to leave you with is a few takeaways that you can um, uh, think about in your own businesses and your own experiences on, on how to, to you know, manage reinvention or pivoting within a company. But I'd like to start by asking each of the panelists to introduce themselves in the context of a, you know, part of their reinvention experience or the companies that they're managing, uh, give a little bit of context for our discussion uh, by way of introduction. Why don't we start with Sudhakar at the end. Sure. Uh, I'm Sudhakar Ramakrishna, currently working as the Chief Development Officer at Polycom. And uh, many of you may know Polycom as the company that built the iconic speakerphone. But we have been reinventing ourselves continuously since then. And I'll talk a little bit about Polycom. But what I want to talk about is some of our collective experiences as we go through this and make it an interactive session. I've had the good fortune of uh, working in some venture-backed startups, as well as some fairly large companies like Motorola. The constant theme has been that there is a need to reshape and reinvent in every single setting. One of the first things I would highlight in my experience is that a lot of times there is this notion that you reinvent or reshape yourself when you experience a near-death experience or when you go through a near-death experience. And my belief is that you can do it when things are actually going well. In fact, the best time to do it is when things are going well, as is the case with our companies and many other companies in the Valley and all over the world. So I'll start with that thought and we'll pass along and then we'll come back to that, which is a lot of times the conventional wisdom is you can reinvent and reshape when you experience a near-death experience. But my view is the best time to do it is when things are going great. And frankly, that is the most difficult time to reinvent yourself, when things are going great. So sure, let's, with that let's, thought, we'll, Let's definitely on. come back to that, yeah. but let's make sure everybody else, uh, we know who we've got on the panel Absolutely. here. So. My, name is, <clears throat> my name is Will Price. And uh, for those of you who just saw Ann Winblad on the panel, I was a partner of Ann's at Hummer Winblad. And about three and a half years ago, I went to run one of the portfolio companies uh, that was backed by Sequoia and Hummer at the time. It was a B2C company um, that had raised quite a bit of money and essentially became obsoleted by both F8 and Apple when they launched the App Store. So what I'd like to share today as we go through this is how you pivot a company. We're now flight today, by the way, just to conclude that thought, is a B2B company. It's one of the leading providers of ad technology to the advertising space, um, and it's doing extremely well. We position ourselves in a category called cloud-based advertising, which allows advertisers to leverage cloud-based applications and resources to power display ads, and I can talk more about that later. But So how do we go from this B to C, no revenue model, 2008 Lehman Brother experience to where we are today, um, and um, certainly the some of the, the pivoting has become a, a well-used word, but we certainly are a company who has pivoted, and I'd like to share some of my experiences in that regard. I'm Randy Commissar. I've actually pivoted myself many times. Um, I was once a rock and roll promoter. I was a, a lawyer. Uh, I was a CEO and CFO. Um, I was a professor at Stanford. Uh, I'm an author, and now I'm a partner at Kleiner Perkins. Uh, the last book I wrote, which is Getting to Plan B, was all about the concept of how to invent and discover your business from day one in a flexible way versus a, the, the problem alluded to earlier, which is the idea of sort of uh, executing against a plan, getting to a near-death experience, and then having to dig your way out of it. Uh, so touch upon that, I guess. 
Uh, I'm Ujjal Kohli. Uh, currently, I'm CEO uh, of a company called Rhythm New Media the, that does video ads on handheld devices such as the iPhone and iPad, etc. Um, I've had two sets of experiences uh, with respect to implementing major change. Uh, one was in a previous incarnation as a McKinsey consultant. They had a big practice called change management, and that was for CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. So that was one set of experiences. And then uh, in my current company, which is uh, about five years old, at the two and a half year point, uh, we were doing well, but not well enough. So we made our major right-hand turn uh, in that company. So, uh, so that was a second experience, more as an entrepreneur. As you all know, uh, the phrase change management has two meanings in the entrepreneurial world. Uh, one change that's led by entrepreneurs and the other one that's led by investors. VCs. Yeah, investors. <laughs> <laughs> so I was fortunate to do the first kind in this company. And uh, the couple of aspects I'd love to talk about is is what's the velocity at which you change? Uh, sometimes there's a temptation to hang on to what you had as a safety mechanism and then land on something new and better somehow. Uh, so do you make a hard right-hand turn? Do you make a gradual turn? How do you decide that? In what situations is each good? And then I think the single most important thing in making it happen, which is communications and how you figure out for each stakeholder uh, how to bring them along on that major change journey, how to plant champions and that sort of thing. Great. Well, why don't we start with that timing question a little bit, because a, a couple of you touched on that. You know, when, when do you know when it's time to pivot, when change? How do you look, for, how do you identify the opportunities um, uh, uh, to change? You know, it's probably different. We have panelists that can talk to big companies and small companies that are trying to find their business model a little bit and probably um, uh, uh, but but you know, so let's speak to the timing. How do you you know how do you know when it's time to change? Uh, in I work mostly with very early stage companies, though I've worked in some larger companies as well. And what I've determined working with early stage companies is that by and large, when they're when investors and the management teams partners. Um, join with an early stage idea, they're largely joining with a plan built completely on assumption. Most of those assumptions are untested. Product's not in the marketplace, customers don't exist yet, no business model in sight. Very, very smart people create wonderful Excel spreadsheets, great presentations, and a lot of wonderful hypotheticals. If you execute against that, chances are you will fail. Just, just by the nature of the fact that it's built completely on a set of untested assumptions. What I have been recommending to my companies is that we think about the journey completely differently. That we don't use the business plan to navigate some sense of success or failure or the direction of the company, but instead come up with a disciplined, rigorous approach of, re of inventing the company on a continual basis from day one. With the idea that we don't know what the business is, we don't know what the product is, we don't know who the customer is, we have a set of assumptions, those need to be tested, they need to be tested quickly and cheaply. And then we need to double down on the right answers and we need to um, move away from the wrong answers. And uh, the process I use is a process called dashboarding. Mm -hmm. Dashboarding has many different um, connotations, but in this connotation, it's an idea of, of being very clear on what question you're asking, being very clear on what assumptions you're testing, being very clear on the metrics and rigorous about the metrics that are going to test that, and then being very clear on what you're going to do if those metrics prove out to be true or false. And what happens in this process is the notion of success and failure changes. Because there's no, there's no right or wrong any longer. There's only good information and bad information. And the, the success of the organization gets determined by how well they ask the questions, how well they measure, and how well they respond. And so the when becomes the notion of measuring. A constant sense of where am I in this in, against my assumptions? How many people are actually using this product? What's their engagement? How are they willing to pay for it? Do they come back? A set of things that lead you to a very clear picture of when your answers are wrong, your assumptions are wrong, and when your assumptions are right, that sort of leans the pivot. So, Doctor, is that the same in a larger organization, a, or what pieces of that you know, can you use there? Absolutely. If I may abstract uh, some of the comments that you made, I believe 
the process of reinvention starts when there is intellectual honesty in the organization. Because oftentimes, like I said, when things are going well, we have a tendency to latch onto it and continue to prove that it's going to continue to be shiny for a very long period of time. And that is when we lose sight of what are the true trends, what are the key dashboard metrics, and maybe we are asking the wrong questions or framing them in ways that create convenient answers that reinforce conventional wisdom. That is true in large companies as well. And my belief is, as leaders and managers who want to be successful, not just in the next year, but for a very long period of time, one of the key things to look for is people with contrarian ideas and contrarian thoughts. When, as leaders, we stop seeing it, and when we stop promoting it, I would say the end is near. And we will have to go through a near-death experience before we can actually reshape or reinvent yourself. And fundamental to also that is the ability to not flog failures. Because oftentimes, especially in large companies, it is easy to get by in many ways. Because you can show great dashboards, fantastic metrics, everything is green or blue, and create an illusion of success because of the fact that there is not enough intellectual honesty in the system, in the organization, not enough contrarian thoughts percolating up, promoting, and there is this fear of, if I fail, I might get flogged. And those are ingredients for failures, and the converse of that can help us have that positive anxiety in the organization to say, maybe my assumptions are incorrect. Maybe I should test my theories one more time. It's not about self-doubt, but it's about positive anxiety. Uta, you wanted to say something about the kind of the timing as well, I think. Uh, well, uh, I think some great comments have been made on, on, on timing. So just to be additive, uh, I think in the high tech sort of entrepreneurial world, uh, one of the things that leads to such change is big events, big external events. Uh, as an example for my company, I decided to make that right hand turn when the iPhone was announced and launched. Uh, that was a big event, I think everyone would agree, and changed the world in many ways. And uh, uh, if you're in a space uh, where such an event impacts you, I think it behooves the team to stop dead in their tracks and say, what just happened and what does it mean? Even if it means transforming the entire company. So I think external events uh, can be a much bigger factor for startups, you know, which I see as sort of a small boat bouncing around in an angry sea. <laughs> Is that consistent with your experience, Will? You've yeah, I would say very much so. I think I just want to pick up on a couple, there's a couple books I like to highlight that really helped me think about it. One is Carol Dweck's book, Mindset. She's a mm -hmm. professor at Stanford. There's a book that just came out called Little Bets by Peter Sims. But the concept of focusing on the process and not the outcome is fundamental to the process of discovery and getting teams. So when we went through a challenging period, what we really focused on was we couldn't predict the future. We didn't know where we'd be in a year or two years, but we could predict what we could do this week. And it was about building agility and honesty uh, into the organization. And so if you, you know, development today, you talk about waterfall development versus agile development. Well, if you think about companies, most companies, bureaucracies are waterfall operating companies. So they operate on like the Chinese on five-year plans, one-year plans. And, and um, I think to Randy's point, those plans are full of just bad assumptions. And I'd, I'd like to challenge people to think about their ability to predict a quarter out. Do you think you can predict the close of the stock market 90 days from now or what the New York Times headline will be in 90 days? The odds are you probably can't. The world is so volatile. So what you need to build is organizations that are very nimble, very agile, very flexible. And there's that fine line then as a manager about how you build some, an organization that is, uh, is nimble versus one that's chaotic. And yeah. are you thrashing or are you, are you innovating? And um, from our perspective, what we decided to focus on was if we could trust ourselves to put really strong processes in place. If our development team had an agile process, our marketing and sales team was being responsive to the market very quickly. And so the cadence of our deliverables went from 90 day to a day then um, we could not fixate on some North Star that was the original business plan, but we could fixate on these really dynamic uh, organizational uh, uh, investments we could make. And then as a management team, we could trust ourselves to be honest and then make those course corrections as they happen. So for us, really um, investing in process and not 
focused on outcomes, allowing the team to say, hey, look, let's be comfortable with ambiguity. We don't know where this is going. I used to joke around with when we were looking to pivot. I'd say, look, it's going to be like that famous Supreme Court justice. It's going to be like pornography. I can't tell you what it is, but once we see it, we'll know it. And, um, but in the meantime, let's just really trust each other and invest in these processes. And so that, that was really fundamental to our success. I, I take a slightly different view on that. I, I agree with what Bill just said. But there's also this notion of don't focus so much on the process or the activities, focus on outcomes. Because one way to look at it is you define the outcome and you let your team lose. And that's where all the creative ideas flow. That's where some of the innovations happen as long as the outcomes are there. And that might apply in some settings that might not apply in other settings. So it depends really on is your market and your situation a very nascent situation where there's a lot of variables, a lot of unknowns, where you need to focus more on the journey versus it's somewhat of a mature uh, setting where there's an opportunity for incremental innovations, not necessarily discontinuities. And that's really where I would say focus more on the outcomes and give a lot of latitude and freedom to the teams to kind of reinvent, reshape themselves on a daily basis to create better outcomes as well. So, so both of you have just sort of touched on kind of establishing a culture, if yeah, you will, absolutely. within the organization. But pragmatically, how do you go about doing that? There's a lot of, you know, so you've described the goal. This is what you want. What do you, you know, to all the panels, what do you do to actually, you know, foster that culture and that, you know, within an organization? What are some of the practical steps you can take to ensure that's the case within your organization? Well, well I think as stated, if, if you don't have intellectual integrity and honesty from day one throughout the team, it, does, it fails. The process will fail. Um, the process of starting up companies in Silicon Valley has historically been one of all the constituents telling white lies to each other. Right? Yeah. You, tell, you start telling white lies to each other the minute you put your business plan together. Mm -hmm. And then you start telling white lies to your board, and your board starts telling white lies to itself about what the outcome should be. And then until there's a near-death experience, nobody gropes with yeah. those things. That's, that's been the history of the way in which con conventional startups have happened in the Valley for the longest time. It's amazing we don't have a higher mortality rate than we do. Um, the, the culture of, of intellectual honesty starts from day one with the idea of, of admitting what you don't know. Mm. Because once you can admit what you don't know, you can now ask the right questions. This process, whether it's one of, 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 of looking for those little wins every day that sort of move the process on the 20 mile march, or whether they're leaping to outcomes, um, is contextual. It really depends upon what your business is, what your challenges are, and that comes down to a very simple process of knowing that you're asking the right questions. Everybody focuses on the answers. I actually think that's yeah. the wrong way to run the innovation process. Um, the answers are unknown, and they will change. If you're asking good questions, you'll be prepared to come up with the right, right answer, answer in any situation. If you're leaping to answers and trying to find safe haven in answers, they will fail you many times. Um, and so I think a process of understanding what you don't know, being intellectually honest about that, not, um, not punishing failure on a personal level. That's not to say everybody wins a prize and goes home. Yeah. Um, you know, we're dealing with a culture like that right now as we see these sort of young entrepreneurs come in. They've all been sort of groomed with this notion that everybody's a winner. Well, not everybody is a winner. And we need to be very clear with ourselves when we are succeeding and when we are failing. That doesn't mean as people we are succeeding or failing. That means our ideas, ideas may be succeeding or failing. It means that the market context in which we're operating in may be creating an environment in which we cannot succeed. I, I think the corollary to this process of innovation and discovery and asking questions is that by and large the mythology of success in the valley is one of the brilliant entrepreneur who gets it right. And that mythology does us all a disservice. Because what we find with the best companies in the Valley, by and large, is they've had to change their business not just once, but many, many times to get to the right answer. And so having changing the mythology to talk more about reinvention, constant discovery, constant innovation, I think serves us much better as an innovation culture. And thus, abstracting again to some, some of the larger companies, my view and experience is it is extremely important to focus on behaviors and reinforcing behaviors. 
Uh, a lot of times we get caught up in project schedules, activities, outcomes, P&Ls, and so on and so forth. They will all come if we focus on the right behaviors. And many times, I've, in my own experience, noticed that we don't focus as much on behaviors because it's kind of soft, or what are you trying to do? It's cultural, and so on and so forth. But every experience I've gone through, as long as we focus on those and continue to reinforce those, the right outcomes will come. Because generally, people are smart. It's not like they're coming to work to screw things up or fail or any of those types of things. As long as you can focus on them, because there is a cultural connotation to it, we focus on the right behaviors and build a culture of patient impatience, especially in large companies, where you're trying to transform, you're trying to create a different model, you're trying to create a different mindset, and that's where you really need to have the culture of patient impatience. All right, I'll start uh, in inviting some questions from the audience just momentarily, but several of the panelists have focused on, you know, avoiding the fear of failure, it's okay, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, as you know, tell me a couple of your favorite experiences by where you found it difficult to overcome some barriers. You know, what were your failures in affecting change and what did you learn from it? Um, you know, uh, uh, you're all here in part because you've successfully managed change, you know, but, but none, nonetheless, undoubtedly, there were a couple of things that you didn't get right the first time uh, that you could have done even better. Um, you know, what, what were some of those things? Well, I think uh, for our business, it was, you know, our widget box was the predecessor to flight, and we had lots of red herring data points. Uh, we had, we served 100 and 50 million widgets a month, they touch 200 million people, and it seemed like from a layman's perspective, there's gotta be a lot of, where there's heat, there's gotta be revenue, and, and um, it, it took, it, it, so it wasn't near death, it wasn't obvious, like, oh, this is totally failing. The hardest part of it was that there was mixed, there was very, the red herring data suggested, hey, there's gotta be something there. And uh, the board um, had invested in this business, and so I think, and, and the, some of the team itself, and so for me, I, um, I probably waited too long, even though I knew in my heart that we couldn't monetize those data points. Um, and I think looking back on it now, like whether it's with a bad person or in this case a model that I don't think is going to generate a venture return, I always know that I should have done, I could have moved faster. This kind of uh, comes back to the yeah. Yeah. yeah, I probably waited. Faster a, is usually better. A quarter to, to two quarters of time, really preparing when I when I knew. It already that that was something I should do, so time. Yeah, uh, so um, I'll share experiences both from a very large company and then entrepreneurial. In a large company, from a VC portfolio point of view, if you have two good ones out of 10, you're good. It's great, you're very good. But to make SVP or EVP in a large corporations, you need to have eight out of 10, not two out of 10. And so the enforcement of that batting average was highly problematic. And uh, I remember not innovating, not taking chances, uh, not even being intellectually honest because of that requirement. And the apparent tension seems to be between accountability and allowing innovation and forgiving trying this, that, or the other thing. Because you miss your numbers, we fire you. And so, you know, that motivates people to not, not miss their numbers. On the other hand, it compromises the need for major change till that near death experience. Now coming to a small company, very different. I think the dynamics between the Series A investor and the founder are key, are really, really key. It's very difficult for founders to be intellectually honest unless they can trust that Series A investor and feel comfortable with them. And the Series A investor emphasizes to them, it's all right. I'm, I'm investing you in you to try different ideas out I didn't give you this money because you blew me away with your business plan, or we're just gonna linearly do that. Uh, I really feel that many entrepreneurs don't really understand that that's where the Series A investor is sitting, if in fact they're sitting in that posture. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're not. Good point. Any other confessionals before we move <laughs> to a question? I, I, I think one thing I've certainly learned in, in my career, and I see it repeated over and over again by my entrepreneurs, is don't hedge. Um, hedging in a startup is a bad idea. You don't have the time, you don't have the resources to hedge. Hedging is a, a result of the little white lie, which is you don't want to give them the hard news, you want to get around the corner and then tell them the, that you just escaped death. You don't want to tell them that you're near death. 
Um, and so I think that when you find yourself in a situation where you see yourself hedging, you feel the right decision is X, but the smart decision is Y, don't trust the smart decision. Yeah. The right decision is the hard, usually the hard decision, and it's usually the decision that cuts off the hedge. Yeah. I, I have a long list to share, but I'm just <laughs> going to keep it to one. Um, this has to do with the people, because we're talking about behaviors and people. Uh, and one of the mistakes I've made in my career is sticking to people in a particular role or function for longer than I should have. The, the signals were all there. And I'm a firm believer that if somebody fails in their role, it's as much their responsibility as it is the manager's responsibility for having put them in the role. Maybe we didn't give them the right tools, articulate the right behaviors, or give them the right feedback, or any number of those types of things. And oftentimes, I think our ego takes over to say, I can turn the situation around, and I can make him or her extremely productive. And that has its inevitable consequences. And one of the things I learned is not to do it. And it's, it's something that you can never say you get it right. You just have to keep repeating it. And that's true for everything that we're talking about here. I don't think we are there ever. Great. We'll go to a question right over here. Uh, yes, I'm Liz Fleming with Shell, and uh, I, I recognize many of the comments uh, that have to do with some of the differences. We realize how different it is to manage innovation than it is to manage the core kind of businesses that are the majority of our businesses. But I was particularly intrigued by your comments about behaviors. Behaviors are really uh, sort of almost a trendy word right now. I've done a lot of work in Shell, both in the kind of the strict behavioral, you know, what behaviorists call behaviorism, and uh, but I also am aware that behaviors have a much looser uh, set of definitions right now. So I'm, I'd like to hear you expound or give some examples of what you consider to be behaviors that you reinforce for an innovative culture. So one of, the, one of my favorite uh, things is start by placing implicit trust. Uh, so there's this conventional wisdom of you have to earn trust. Frankly, we don't have time with one another to earn trust over a very long period of time. So if we fundamentally believe that we're all here to do the right thing, start by placing implicit trust. That goes a little bit against conventional wisdom, but I have found that to be very, very effective in, in my experience, where you're essentially, by placing implicit trust, you're disarming any agendas, so to speak, or at least you're proposing to disarm, disarm a lot of agendas. And you can remove a lot of clutter and put a lot of positive focus on what needs to get done. So that's one example. Uh, and another behavior that we try to promote constantly, which uh, we have varying degrees of success, is this whole notion of creating an environment to discuss, debate, and eventually align. Because uh, various people use it in different, uh, use different words to describe it. But I think having the ability to have a vigorous debate and creating an environment where it's okay to disagree will ferret out a lot of issues very early in the cycle and, and save us all a lot of time and energy and money. And a lot of cultures do not promote debate and uh, because of the need to comply or the fear of failure or the fear of being the odd person out in a group and so on and so forth. So those are things that if we can actively practice as leaders, I think will help change cultures and behaviors and outcomes. Uh, and there's a longer list, but I'll keep it to two for now. I had a quick Go ahead. So um, I worked for Intel in the early 80s. And uh, when you joined Intel in the early 80s, every new employee had to take two courses. And they were called Constructive Confrontation 1 and Constructive Confrontation 2. And exactly what Sudhakar is talking about. They trained every employee to engage in that debate. Great. I think we got another question right over here. Uh, Ricardo from Qualcomm. So if I get this right, you're saying that in the world of increasingly in certain markets, um, it's really about uh, empirical-based thinking, knowledge gathering, experimenting quickly, et cetera. Uh, but where does that leave, or is there still any room for rational-based thinking, for theory, strategy, vision, or is it the end of all of that? <laughs> I certainly don't think it's the end of all no. that. I think that they layer on top of each other uh, in a very, a very important way. Um, you can't, I don't think you can arrive at sort of empirical thinking without having a thesis. That thesis has to start someplace more abstract. You've got to have a vision of the world to have a thesis. And so my sense is that we're not talking about either or. 
we're talking about a more effective process of taking a vision and a thesis to impact, to actually being able to execute against a thesis. Uh, the problem we have with the, the rift between theoretical thinking today and empirical thinking today is large part one of conversion of theory to practice and practice to success. I think what we're talking about today is a way of aligning them better, actually, and doing it more systematically with less, sort of, with less chance in the process and more process. And just to reinforce that, I do believe they layer on each other because there is a connotation of discipline on one hand, and there's another connotation of flexibility and agility on the other hand, and you need both. And in the part, there is a, a connotation to be made of if you have discipline or the waterfall, waterfall process that you mentioned, uh, there is a certain level of discipline associated with it, but there is a certain level of slowness associated with it as well, rigidity, lack of flexibility. And one of the things that is increasingly becoming evident uh, to myself and a lot of others is the need to be agile and flexible is paramount. Because in this world, the information asymmetry no longer exists. So there is, there is nobody who can say, I have uh, kind of knowledge of this and nobody else does. I mean, the web and the internet and everything else that goes on with it have broken down a ton of barriers. So what can you do to win? You yeah. need to be flexible and agile and, and be willing to shift. Yeah, let me pick up on that. So I think from a strategy perspective, what I think about at a macro level is there's $91 billion of brand spend in the United States. 6% of it's online, six, okay? There's $55 billion of, of, of direct response spend and 33% is online. So there's this massive differential between brand spend and direct response. So from a strategy perspective, I ask myself, I say, do I want to spend my career and my company's resources on betting that the 91 billion is going to go from 6% to 10% to 12% to 18%? Absolutely, that's strategy, right? That's like, I'm convinced that's going to be the case. And if you look at how under-invested media is online relative to offline, given where people spend their time and the trend lines and everything, that's strategy. That's thinking about, all right, that's the market we're going to go after. But what I think we mean in terms of the agility part of it is like, well, how do I sell? Who do I sell to? What product do I have? What price point should I set? Um, should I do inside sales? Should I do outside sales? Um, where are my leads coming from? Those are all things that, those are mini experiments I need to run quarter to quarter to learn. So I think when I sit down in front of the company, I tell them, listen, we're going to build a business that's going to go public because we're going to ride a 6% to 30% shift in capital. Even in a zero-sum economy where we trend line flat GDP growth, it doesn't matter to me because I'm just going to kill people who are competing in that offline world because we're so much better and so much more efficient. So guys, we don't care about economic growth. We don't care about the GDP. We care about a massive reallocation of capital from one sector to another. Now what I need you to work out is how do we get that? That's what I mean by you know, the tactics, right? It's like, how do we get at that? How do, how do we beat our competition? How do we convince our customers who have been, uh, who've codified or calcified around an old model to adopt something new and, and help them adopt it? So I totally think that they layer on top of each other, and that's just a very specific example of how I try to layer this flexibility with this long-term vision. Uh, Ujjal, when, when you, uh, regardless of whether the strategy and or tactics that result in part of the vision and where that comes from, you know, as you have it or whatever that vision is for the moment before it changes yet again, you've got to get buy-in throughout the organization and the various constituencies. Um, you know, how do you, how do you effectively communicate within the organization and get that, that buy-in plan? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. That, that's an area I think is really important to get it done. And I think, uh, uh, in my opinion, the best way is to project manage communications just as you met project manage a product development. Uh, that means, for example, to lay out who the stakeholders are, your employees, your investors, your customers, your partners, your law firm, lay out literally all of those stakeholders, figure out what their concerns are and what the communications plan is for each of them, who's going to do what on what day, and then have meetings to follow up. Did it happen? And uh, especially when a big, big change is launched, such as in, in my case, uh, for my little company, uh, we changed out half the employees and uh, completely changed the customers we were going to call on and the business model. Uh, and, and, you know, that's an airplane in flight. So in that circumstance, you know, those communications are central and it's very, very, very hard to over-communicate. So, 
you know, lean in that direction and project manage it systematically uh, is the lesson I learned through my experiences. Here we've got a question in the back there. Yeah, I got, uh, I got one, one part of the question on reinvention and one part on pivoting, right? So, so on reinvention, I would love to hear examples of companies, both large or small, in, in the panel's experience, that have guttered a core business that was revenue successful, look, you know, all the numbers were right, but wasn't the right strategy, reinvented themselves and became successful even more, right? So that's one. And then the second part of that would be pivoting, right? If you don't have, I mean, the perfect world is a perfect world, but if you don't have an organization where intellectual integrity is being scaled, right? Let's say you don't have it. Is it okay to have windows of intellectual integrity? You know, certain time frames in which you're going to pivot the company, and you take advantage of that really fast and make it happen. So I'd love to hear cases that highlight both of them. So, thanks. If I can go first in sure. terms of um, the reinvention, so to speak, that we're going through right now as a company. Uh, and I came here committed not to talk too much about what we're doing, but since the example uh, or the question came up, I'm going to give you an example of what we're doing. So we, I like to say we are in the business of enabling people to communicate, collaborate, and be more productive. Well, that's a fairly large thing. It's got many different connotations to it. And within those connotations, there's a lot of flexibility and agility involved. And as a company, Polycom, I said at the beginning that we are the company that invented the iconic speakerphone that's there in 94% of um, the conference rooms worldwide. But since then, we have been taking voice communications, made it visual communications, and have created telepresence and reduced the distance barriers and time barriers and so on and so forth. But those are all incremental reshapings and reinventions that we have done over the years. One of the things that we find now is the world, especially with the mobility and cloud and the access to bandwidth, is shifting radically from, let's say, conventional ways of supporting some of these paradigms, which are largely premise-based, bought by an IT administrator, deployed, and you kind of have a hold, so to speak, on that. Whereas now it's going into different types of device form factors, different types of communication modalities, integration of social media with visual communications and so on and so forth. So what do we do? So instead of being a product-based company, so to speak, we have transformed ourselves to become a platform-based company. If you really think about it, that's got many connotations of mobility, agility, because as you're a platform, you open it up to value add both by yourself and by your ecosystem. In that context, your solution is much larger than your own internal company. So that has to go through a transformation. That requires culture change. That requires breaking down barriers. And we, I would say we're in the midst of doing it. In doing that, we don't have to necessarily gut everything out with the old and in with the new kind of a thing. I look at it as how can I improve asset velocity by leveraging what I have and transforming myself faster and better than anybody else can who may be in a more desperate situation. So it is to act with that level of positive anxiety that I said earlier, but in from a healthy base, so to speak. But what's unquestionable is the trends are there. If we lose sight of it, we could become extinct. And so that deep realization exists, and which is why we've transformed it and we've announced it. You know, uh, and, uh, to your point, I think that the difficulty in uh, coming up with the names of the companies that are uh, pivoting their businesses um, off of really successful businesses is that we often think about that as an evolution of the business, not a pivot, because we don't get to see mm -hmm. what's really going on inside the organization. But if you look at what's going on in Netflix right now, that is a, a gigantic pivot. These guys were in the UPS business, and they're now going to be in the essentially in the in Comcast business, right? That is a gigantic shift. We think about it as, oh, well, we're still getting movies. But from an internal standpoint, a completely different business, yeah. probably different people and different leaders, a very different business model. Your second question about whether you can pivot using windows of intellectual honesty, I think you take <laughs> no. what you can get. But I think in, in, to some extent that mis, um, misunderstands or misstates the, the ongoing nature of the pivot. 
Pivots aren't once in a while. I, yeah, I wrote in my book, Getting to Plan B, Plan B is a metaphorical B because you're always getting to the next plan. Yeah. It is the next plan. And if you don't have a culture that's constantly doing that, you may have the opportunity to get around a corner, few, but then you're going to find yourself in another bind. So you've got to sort of work on that culture and those behaviors. Yeah. I, I, one yeah. of that I love, I don't know if people would agree with this, but I think Oracle reinvented itself. When Larry Ellison hired Chuck Phillips and Stafford Katz, how many people thought, what is he doing, right? An equity analyst and a banker. And look at Oracle, went from yeah. a sales-driven company that didn't have a lot of operational excellence to the best M&A machine in software. 32% you know, cash flow, profit margins. I mean, the guy is a machine right now. So I think that Oracle, I argue, eight years ago was a company in distress, but now it's obviously the number one player in enterprise software done through M&A done right. And he brought in different people to make him help make that happen. And he saw a maturing industry and just you know, look at the companies he's rolled up in the last eight years. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the, the sign and the advice uh, that, that applies to all speakers, never stand be between a crowd and lunch. Uh, uh, so uh, just to remind everybody that lunch is back in the, the main ballroom. Do, do tweet your, uh, uh, your thoughts and takeaways to IMM, IIMC, the hashtag IIMC. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for being here.